So tonight, on behalf of Harvard Bookstore, I am honored to welcome Salman Rushdie and Maria Tatar to the stage. They're here to discuss Luca and the Fire of Life, Mr. Rushdie's newest book, which is a fabulous celebration of storytelling for children and adults alike. I'm thrilled that Maria Tatar, one of the world's foremost experts on folklore and children's literature, is here tonight to talk about it with Mr. Rushdie. Maria Tatar is the Chair of Folklore and Mythology and the Loeb Professor of Dramatic Languages and Literatures at Harvard University. She's also the acclaimed editor of the annotated classic Fairy Tales and has authored numerous books on the Brothers Grimm, Fairy Tales, and 19th and 20th century literature. And seated next to Professor Tartar is, wonderfully, Salman Rushdie. Salman Rushdie is the author of 10 previous novels, including Satanic Verses, The Ground Beneath Her Feet, Haroon in the Sea of Stories, and Midnight's Children, which is winner of both the Booker Prize and the Booker of Bookers. He has published a collection of short fiction and three works of nonfiction, and co-edited two anthologies, Mirror Work and Best American Short Stories, 2008. Mr. Rushdie served as president of Penn American Center and continues to work as the president of the Penn World Voices International Literary Festival, which he helped to create. Ladies and gentlemen, it is such an honor to have Mr. Rushdie here with us tonight. Without further ado, please join me in welcoming both of our guests, Professor Maria Tatar and Salman Rushdie. Salman, it's such a great honor to welcome you here to Cambridge. And we know, of course, that you could be almost anywhere in the world. And I say almost anywhere in the world. So we're <laughs> especially grateful that you have chosen to come to Cambridge uh -huh. to celebrate your wonderful new book. Um, it is exquisite. As those of you who have seen the cover will know, it is exquisite on the outside. And if you've had a chance to look inside, you'll know that it is intoxicating on the inside. And I've had a chance uh, to read it twice this week. Uh, once was not enough. And it is so rich. And it is one of those books that gets better with each reading. So here I am fulfilling the fantasy of being able to interview the author of a book that I love. Ooh. And uh, there is a way in which I want to talk about children's books, but this is a book that takes on all of the great existential mysteries. Uh, it takes up mortality, suffering, pain, uh, entropy, and yet it also gives us love, the consolations of the imagination, and magic. So I want to start by asking you uh, to respond to something that Philip Pullman once said, and he tells us that there's some topics, some subjects, some themes so large that they can only be taken up in a children's book. That is, you can't write about those things in a mm. book for adults. And can you say something about that? How? Well, I mean, I'd, I certainly can see that, see him putting that in practice, you know, I mean, taking on these mm. colossal themes um, in his books, um, the death of God, you know, to name only two. Um, I, I remember thinking, you know, when I wrote the book before this, when I wrote Haroon and the Sea of Stories, which was at a bad time in my life, you know, and it was at the height of the trouble around the satanic verses. And it suddenly seemed to me that this was like, not just a good way to write about it, but the most useful way of, of approaching that very big matter in my life anyway. Um, so I think, these, I think he's got a point, you know, and I think indirection, play, all these things are very good ways of approaching the toughest material. You know, and and, and uh, I've always had a fondness for writing that somehow goes against the grain of what it's writing about. So if you're writing about something very dark, death, for example, you should make it extremely funny. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, and, uh, and conversely, if you're writing about funny things, you should try to bore people. Uh, <laughs> um, I mean, I, you know, there's the famous line of Woody Allen's when asked by an interviewer if he was happy at the thought that he would live on in his films and in his work. He said, no, he would prefer to live on in his apartment. <laughs> <laughs> And, uh, 
And so, which that's what I mean by taking on the subject of life and death and turning it into, into comedy. Into comedy, and yet also, I, I just, as you were speaking, I thought of the title for chapter one, the terrible thing that happened on the beautiful starry night. Mm. So is beauty in some ways also an antidote to the yeah. darkness? And well, I think beauty is an antidote for almost any pain, really. I think so. And I don't know, well, one of the things one tries to do is to put as much of it into the language as you can because if, if the language can have a sort of pleasure, then, then you can write about almost anything. And, and there are books that I admire but can't really love because their language doesn't do anything for me. You know, where, whereas the great, even the greatest literature for younger readers, the magic is in, ha, in, is in the words, you know, that's true of the Alice books, transcendently true of the Alice books, that, it's, that magic is entirely in the language. You know, it, it really would be nonsense if it wasn't for the language that makes it sense. Well, yes, and of course the book begins with a curse. Yeah, um, a child's curse. A child's curse. Tell us about that and the power. You know, suddenly the child discovers that you can do things with words. Well, you know, the thing about the boy, Luca, is that he's left-handed. And he's always been told by his brother, who is right-handed, that left-handedness is, you know, sinister. Um, and dark. he discovers a kind of dark power in himself, you know, that he actually delivers this curse against this cruel circus owner who mistreats his animals, and the curse comes true. Um, you know, he says, whatever it is, may your circus burn down and all your animals run away, and the circus burns down and the animals run away. Um, and he... His brother, rather admiringly, says to him, I never managed to do anything as dark as that. So he's got a dark side. And this was proven to me, well, in the real life boy, I mean, my younger son, Milan, for whom I wrote the book, I was worried about the character of death. I mean, there's a figure of death in the book. It's a character called Nobo Daddy, which I have to say is, I should confess, is not my invention. It's, it's, from, it's from Blake. And, and in, in Blake, Blake actually has a poem called To Nobo Daddy, which is, a, Nobo Daddy is God for Blake. And it's, it's a poem about the, about the absent, derelict father. You know, you're never there, you don't come around, you don't help, you, don't, we can't, you know, we can't turn to you for anything. What kind of father are you anyway? Blake complains to God. Um, in this book, it's, Nobo Daddy is not God, he's, but he's something very like the angel of death. And, and I worried that it might be too dark that the materials, to use Philip Pullman's phrase, might be too dark. You know? and, and I showed it to my son without saying anything. I'd say, just say, read the first couple of chapters, tell me what you think, and was very worried. I mean, I had my fingers crossed because I thought if he doesn't like it, I'm screwed. You know? <laughs> <It's> <laughs> um, <for him> <laughs> because I don't know how else to tell this story. Hmm. And, and fortunately, not only did, was he not scared, by this character, but he actually, without prompting, said that it was his favorite character. And that made me think, A, that I'm probably okay, I could probably go, you know, keep on with it, and B, I thought, well, maybe this kid is a little darker than I thought. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I can um, push it. And yet, you know, it seems to me that death is such a prominent figure in books for children. Mm -hmm. Sometimes, I mean, there's Voldemort, of course, but sometimes masquerading as uh, somebody that doesn't seem so dark and sinister. Yeah. Uh, everything from really good night moon with mm -hmm. those last words, good night noises everywhere in the darkness, yeah. um, which see, it seems like such an innocent story. Uh -huh. Or Charlotte's Web, which starts out, Where's Papa going with that axe? Yes, exactly. So it's, I love the fact that your son, uh, son's instincts were so right yes. in, in that. And I mean, way. Charlotte doesn't survive. Sh right, um, right, um, right, right. In, exactly. in Charlotte's Web. And I don't know, I don't find Voldemort frightening. <laughs> <laughs> I think there's a problem with Voldemort, which is that he's not really scary. He's, uh, I mean, uh, he's horrible. Yeah. You know. Yeah. It's uh, like Rafe finds with a stocking over his head. <laughs> 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 uh, well, uh, but he's not scary. 
tell I us know. tell us more about the dialogue with your son because we do have Haroon in the sea of stories, yes. and then Luca in the fire of yeah. life. Yeah, well, that and was that was very definitely my way of trying to differentiate the book. You know, the sea yeah. of stories. I mean, that that book is all about water imagery. It's all it's it's yeah. all about how um, how stories are fluid and mutable by because of being fluid. And so if there's a sea of stories where all the streams of the stories are interweaving amongst each other, they have the possibility of combining with each other and turning into different stories. And, and that fluidity and the metamorphic nature of, of the, the, of, that it creates you know, was, was very much the sort of central image of that book. And it, it was actually taken from there's a, the title of a famous story compendium in India Sanskrit, I mean, kind of like the Arabian Nights, you know, one of those. There's a compendium which is called Katha Sarit Sagar, which, which literally translates as the ocean of the streams of story. And, and in that book, there is no such ocean, that's just, it's just the title of the book, you know, it's a, it's a title for a compendium of stories. But it made me think, sometimes it's very good to take metaphor literally, you know, and, and to say, supposing there was an ocean with streams of story in it, what would that be like, and what would it mean, and what would it do? Um, and that came out of that. And this time I thought, I mean, there's a very important speech in the book by a minor character. There's a, there's a tiny character, actually tiny in every respect, physically tiny character, called a firebug, yeah. who turns up at one point and later on in the novel turns out to be a spy. But anyway, the firebug is very indignant about the privileging in people's imagination of water over fire. People think water good, fire bad. You know, and as he points out, you know, if water causes a flood, everybody, nobody blames water. <laughs> <laughs> if fire burns a house down, they say fire is a terrible yeah. thing. Hmm. And he is indignant as a representative of fire, and, and he has this moment where he says, he says, life is not a drip. You know, he gets particularly annoyed about the, the image of the fountain of life. The idea that life you, comes yes, from right. water, he finds contemptible. Yeah. He says, life is not a drip. He says, life is a flame. You know, so, so, so the idea that of this book, since it's about life, about the preservation, you know, this father's life, Luca's father's life is in danger and needs to be saved, the idea of life being a flame um, that, that needs not to be extinguished. So this book is full of like fire imagery. Yes, although it, your symbolic geography in this book is wonderful too, and I, I particularly like the torrent of words. Yes, uh, the torrent of words. That fall into <laughs> the placid lake of wisdom. Uh, but uh, tell me a little bit about the, just continuing with the father-son question. Yeah. Uh, uh, not just the dialogue with your son about the book, but also, uh, I remember in my first reading, it seemed to me that there was such a harmonious relationship between the father and son, yeah. Rashid. Uh, and and it, there was a bond that had been produced through storytelling. Yeah. Was that also your experience as a child, uh, that is, you know, having this bond created? Yeah, it was, actually. You know, and, and one of the things I, you know, I've feel, been feeling the need to say is that everybody thinks that the character of Rashid in the book, the storyteller, is like a comic version of me, mm -hmm. which to an extent it is, you know, but it's also a version of my father, you know, because, because that was the first storyteller I ever knew, you know, and, 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 and he was a very good, he was a very good bedtime storyteller. And the way in which I learned, first heard many of the great kind of wonder tales of the East, you know, um, was in his versions of them. So Sinbad the Sailor and you know, Aladdin and Ali Baba and all of that, you know, that I first heard about in his tellings of them, which I remember as being very eloquent. You know, my sisters and I would hear these. And, and so he was you know, the Shah of Blah you know, right. in my life. Right. Um, and certainly it, it was, it was uh, the forging of a, of a it caused, brought about the forging of a bond, you know, between us. Um, later on in our lives, our relationship became more difficult, but, but that certainly that childhood thing was very much there, and I wanted to, to draw on that, you know, not, not just on my relationship right. with my sons, but my relationship with my father, too. Um, I do think that there's a moment, I mean, the book is, the book proposes the idea 
that the telling and receiving of story is very close to the heart of the kind of creature that we are as human beings. Um, you know, when, after we are born, once we receive a bit of nourishment, very early on what we want is somebody to sing us a song and somebody to tell us a story. And it's, it's right at the beginning of life and it remains so. And there's a moment in the book when Luca, in a kind of slip of the tongue, refers to something as being only a story. Mm. And, the, and actually the, the death figure, Nobo Daddy, scolds him and says, you know, you of all people, your storyteller's son, you of all people should know that there's nothing, it's not just, nothing is only a story. And, and he says, man is the storytelling animal. And I think that's, if there's an author's message in the book, you know, it's in that line because, because we are the only creature on earth that does this, as far as we know. This is a rather strange habit of telling each other stories, sometimes true stories, sometimes not true stories, right. as, as a way of understanding the kind of creature that we are. And then fascinatingly, I think, uh, you create in this book a kind of syncretic mythology. That is, you draw on mythologies from all over Everywhere. the world. Yeah. And it's so refreshing that in instead of having this sort of geopolitical clash of cultures, um, suddenly we have something which brings together all of the foundational myths from different cultures, from different times and places. And I wanted to ask you about that and mm. whether your father was in some ways the source of that. He pa did he pass that on to you? Well, he was a little bit. He was very scholarly, my father, although he wasn't a scholar, I mean, he, but he was very widely read. Yeah. And, uh, and certainly, yeah, passed on that interest. And, and then, you know, I followed it up myself. And, and certainly, one of the things that was, for me, a discovery in the, in the preparation for this book was how much in common the world's mythologies have. You know, how, I mean, I knew that it was sort of true that there are sky gods everywhere and there's right. this and that that they have in common, but, um, but for instance, the, the, the quest for fire story, you know, is that there simply is not a mythology on earth that doesn't have one, whether you're, whether you're in, China or amongst the Native American myths or Latin America or the Greeks and Romans or wherever you look. Mm -hmm. And it seemed to me that maybe this is the oldest story, you know. Um, it's either that or the sky god. It's, it's difficult to know which is the oldest story. Mm -hmm. um, I feel that maybe the quest for fire is even earlier because fire is the thing that made us human. Yeah. You know? um, oh, and you bring in the story of Prometheus. Yes. Um, and I, I wanted you to read from, from the book for a moment uh, uh, the passage where Luca becomes aware of the fact that he is, he's become part of this storytelling tradition. He's drawing his courage. Uh, he is also a kind of thief and trickster. He's cunning. Yes. He has the traits of the folkloric hero. Yes. But uh, I was particular, there's so many passages here that I would like you to read, but if you could, um, this is where Tell he, find, where okay. he discovers, I mean, I think one of the things about the hero in a quest like this is that he has to, dis he has to find himself at some point, you know? He has to find in himself the thing which enables him to achieve the quest, you know? And, um, then something happened. Luca became aware of a change within himself. He felt as if something more powerful than his own nature had taken control of him, some will stronger than his own that was refusing to accept the worst. No, Rashid's life was not over. It could not be, therefore it was not. The will stronger than Luca's own rejected that possibility. Nor would it allow Luca to give up, to flinch in the face of danger or cower in the face of terror. This new force that had gripped him was giving him the strength and courage he would need if he was going to do what needed to be done. It felt like something not himself, something from outside, and yet he also knew that it was coming from within him, that it, was, that it was his own strength, his own determination, his own refusal of defeat, his own strong will. For this too, Rashid Khalifa's storytelling, the Shah of Blah's many tales of young heroes finding extra resources within themselves in the face of horrible adversity had prepared him. We don't know the answers to the great questions of who we are and what we are capable of, Rashid liked to say, 
until the questions are asked. Then and only then do we know if we can answer them or not. Thank you. Uh, so that is reaching back to myth, but there are also some quite modern postmodern revolutionary moments in the narrative because we have a hero who uses, or we have a plot that uses uh, the video format. Mm -hmm. So suddenly we have sequential tasks and different levels. Luca has to go through different levels. He has to, he has to save, save lives. Save them at saving points. <laughs> and was that, ins I assume that was inspired by your son, yeah. although maybe well, it's you inspired are inspired by, you know, we live <laughs> in this world, don't we now, um, in which this is all around us. And it just became stuff, material that was available to use as a way of orchestrating yeah. the, the narrative. And it was funny, you know. Um, always, you know, the, the great, the great m in, in Who Framed Roger Rabbit, there's, 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 there's a moment at which Roger Rabbit, who has been pretending not to be able to get his hands out of the handcuffs, for, until he suddenly get, just takes them out. And, and the Bob Hoskins character says to him, what do you mean you could have done that all the time? <laughs> And he right. says, no, like, only when yeah. it was funny. <laughs> and, I think, and I think that's a very important principle. Do it when it's funny. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, um, but there's also a kind of cinematic style yeah. in this narrative yeah. that is, um, I mean, I could talk about the many texts that inspired you, and, and I hope we get to Alice in Wonderland at, at some point. But um, I remember reading your wonderful volume on The Wizard of Oz. Mm -hmm. Uh, on the MGM film, and how it was the film that inspired you to become a writer. Uh, yeah. And I wonder if you could say something about that in the context of what you might call a kind of cinematic style mm. in your work. Well, it's uh, true, it's true. I mean, I went home from watching the, and I was in Bombay. I'd never been to America or anywhere outside India and Pakistan at the time. I saw The Wizard of Oz, and I went home, and I wrote a story called Over the Rainbow, which was not about those characters. It, it was about a boy like me in a city like mine walking down the sidewalk and seeing not the end of the rainbow but the beginning of the rainbow, just arcing up and away from him and, and rather usefully had rainbow-colored steps cut into it. Um, so he goes on a journey over the rainbow and meets magical creatures. And I wrote it and my father got his secretary to type it up and then said, you're only a kid, so you'll lose it, so I'll look after it for you. So he kept it and he lost it. <laughs> um, uh, but I, I do think that in this book there's a, a, a kind of deliberate almost uh, filmic acceleration, you know, and I want, the, it's, yeah. interestingly, when my editor at Random House read through the manuscript and was working on it with me, he said, look, there's one phrase that keeps recurring in this book and you've used it too much. And it was the phrase, at high speed. <laughs> Everything in this book happens at high speed. And I had used the phrase, without knowing it, I'd used it like 20 times, which is, you know, 18 times too many. Um, and, and, um, and it was because I wanted the book to have this quality of acceleration. It know? has a sort of racing energy. Well, if you know, if, you're, yeah. if there's this boy who thinks his father's dying, and he doesn't know that how long know. he's got, mm -hmm. it's urgent. You know, so I, I wanted that urgency in his feelings to be communicated by the, the pace of the narrative. And, and the cinema has given us ways of accelerating storytelling now, you know, um, because our perception of image has, in, has become so much faster than it used to be. If you look at old silent films, if you just look at the length of the, sh of the shot, the length of the cut, you know, it, it, it's much longer. When there's a title card with the words on it, the title card stays on there, you know, forever. And you think, for goodness sake, we read it already, get it off. Um, and, it's, yeah. and it's because we can now take that information much faster than we used to. So you can have cuts that go like that and we receive all the information. So I think we've learned how to perceive and receive faster because of cinema. Yes, and uh, yet you also linger in a wonderful way with words. And before we open things up to the audience, I, I just want you to read a description of Og oh, yes. to right. give um, everyone a sense of that, the way in which you, you well, work magic with words. Well, this is, a, this is a, a character called Captain Og. The word Og means fire in Hindi and Urdu. Um, Captain Og, who is... Um, 
who's a bad guy. He's actually starts off at the beginning of the book being the evil circus master um, that Luca curses. But it becomes clear in the magic world when they're there that the evil circus master is just a sideline, that actually he's one of the, the guardians, uh, gatekeepers of the heart of the world of magic. And at this point, he's actually riding on a dragon, but never mind that. Um, he was a man of hair and anger, this Arg whose henna-tinted locks stood out from his head like wrathful orange serpents. A man, too, of chin hair, whose russet beard stuck out in all directions like the rays of an ill-tempered sun. A man of eyebrows, quarrelsome scarlet bushes, which curled upward and outward above a pair of glaring black eyes. And a man also of ear hair, long, stiff, crimson strands of ear hair that corkscrewed outward from both those fleshy organs of hearing. Blood-red hair sprouted up from Arg's shirt at the collar and out from his pirate's greatcoat at the cuffs. And Luca imagined the captain's entire body covered in a luxuriant growth, as if that body were a farm and hair its only crop. <laughs> Soraya, also a flame-haired person, whispered in Luca's right ear that this grandmaster's bushy excessivity of hair might give all redheads a bad name. <laughs> so, Thank you for nice. reminding us of the nice. sorcery of words, of language. Um, and we would love to hear questions from you. Yeah. Uh, I should uh, say that, that there's a thing about the rhythm of that passage that, in my mind, is stolen from Dickens. You know, there, there's a kind of Dickensian quality, deliberate Dickensian quality about the cadences of that, you know. Um, I can't think of a particular passage, but... The but beginning of Bleak House. <laughs> the beginning of Bleak House, the beginning of Mutual Friend, you know. I mean, there's London Bridge, you know, there are three bridges which are, one, one was, is of wood and one is of stone and etc. There's a kind of, that, that kind of repetition the, cumula the cumulative effect of the comedy by repetition and small modulations, that's a Dickensian trick. So, I mean, if you're going to steal, steal the good stuff. Yeah, <laughs> right, right, right. So, are we, um, let's see, where is Heather? Are, should we just continue talking or? People can uh, come I and think ask you'll questions. come up to the, oh, there, there we go. Don't our, be shy. Our first question. First question. Here it comes. <laughs> <laughs> and, and please line up uh, behind him if you'd like to ask a question. Oh, yeah, yeah. Mr. Rushdie, I'm a very devout admirer of your uh, novels and Thank your you. works. But uh, what I love the most is that uh, although your novels are accessible to all, your material is so eclectic and your power of storytelling draws from so many different traditions. But the most beautiful aspect for me as, as uh, a native Urdu speaker is that you always couch the most intimate particulars in Urdu. So like uh, when I enjoyed the, the, the massive power of this book, I love I love the fact that the city is Kahani and, you know, it's in the land of Alif Bey and the nemesis to the storytellers is Khatam Shud. So I, I love that, that blend of colossal and particular so that no matter how accessible your material is and how universal your strain of thought is, but at heart it's, it's the, the Indian Urdu that persists. Well, thank you, question mark. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, I, at the end of Harun and the Sea of Stories, I actually did put a, a little glossary of proper nouns in the text that were derived from Hindi, Hindi Urdu originals. Kahani, which is the name of the town that it happens in, is actually the word for story. Um, and Khatam um, Shud, of course, is not in this book, he's in the other book, but, but the, he's the villain, uh, which means kind of finished, completely done for, etc. So there are bits of Urdu, yes, scattered around. And in this book, I just decided not to put the glossary in. Why? Because I'm mean. <laughs> <You know? laughs> and and uh, yeah, I remembered when I was younger and I started reading uh, a lot of the great Jewish-American writers of the post-war period, the kind of Roth, Malamud, Bellow writers, that they would frequently sp sprinkle their text with um, Yiddish. You know, I remember reading in, I think, Portnoy's complaint. Um, somebody, at one point, delivers to Portnoy a Zets in the Kishkas. And I remember sitting in England or somewhere thinking, Zets? 
kishkas, you know. <laughs> what is this? Is it something to eat? You know, uh, and working out from context that it was some kind of a blow. And then, then I thought, well, if he can do it, I can do it. <laughs> so it's Philip Roth's fault. And again, folks, if you'd like to um, ask questions, please step forward to this microphone here in the center aisle. Or I can take pity on the folks in the balcony. If you don't want to head downstairs, if you want to raise your hand, I can re repeat your question into this microphone. If there's anybody upstairs with a question. Uh, how about you then? Yeah. Hi. Hi. Hi, everybody. Um, my question for you is you had mentioned when you were writing Haroon that the question that inspired you was, what if there was a sea of stories? Did you have a question that inspired you when you wrote Luca? Yes. I mean, the, the, the idea of the world of magic that Luca steps into or stumbles into, um, that the idea is that it exists like half a step to the right of the world we live in. And if you just happen to know how to stumble into it, you can, you can find it. It's a way of talking about the relationship of imagination to reality. You know, it's like, wh what is the relationship of the world of, of, of dream and fantasy and imagination to the concrete and material world you know, that, that we live in? And it, it's easy to believe that they are completely separate, that there's, you know, one of them is, is, is non-existent and fanciful and make-believe, and the other one is, is concrete and actual, and here we all are in it. But it seemed to me that that's not so, because, because that boundary is crossed all the time. And in fact, um, almost everything that we now take for granted started in somebody's imagination. You know, a microphone, for example. Um, much of the modern world would seem like a, a fairy tale to our grandparents. You know, a video camera, an airplane, a cell phone, a television set, you know, um, the internet, for goodness sake, you know? Uh, the, all of this, before you can make a wheel, you have to dream a wheel. Um, and so the whole of human effort is, in fact, a process of bringing things over from the world of our imagination into the actual, into the actual, from the imagined to the actual. And so in this book, in the, in the imagined world, there is this thing, the fire of life, which if found and brought into the actual world can save a life. You know? and, and that just becomes a way of dramatizing this, this, this matter about, about, the, about how the imagined world and the actual world are not separate places. Mm -hmm. You know, that, that in fact, who said in dreams begin responsibilities? Is it, I know it's the title of a Salvador Dali painting, um. But I don't think he made it up. Delmore Schwartz, thank you. I knew somebody knows. I'm <laughs> Harvard, somebody down by water. <laughs> I went to the other Cambridge. Oh. It's a little bit older. Um, but thank you, Delmore Schwartz. It, it's that idea that from dreams comes actuality, you know, and, and that was what I was trying to explore. Good evening. Hi. Good evening. I'm a high school teacher of Huck Finn and the Odyssey, and so I was very much interested in reading about the mythical adventure in this story. My question is that Joseph Campbell says that the gods of myth are a personification of the potential of human spirituality. Mm. And I suppose you don't have to agree. I don't have to. <laughs> but um, <laughs> if you did, then do you have a comment about what that means, that the traditional gods in your text at well, the end of the story? Are I, I just have a slightly different, I mean, I've, you know, I've, of course, I've, I've read Joseph Campbell, but, um, but I have a slightly different, uh, I come at it from a, in a slightly different way. Um, what seems to me to be interesting is that these uh, great pantheons um, were once living religions. You know, the Greek gods were once the religion of Greece. And the Roman gods, ditto, and the Norse gods the same, and the Aztec gods the same, and so on. And they had priests and temples and no doubt inquisitions and the whole apparatus of, of a church, um, which doesn't attract me. 
But when people stop believing in them literally, they become available to us to believe in in a much more interesting way, which is in the way that we believe in literature, the way, the way the, the, and we find in them the truth that we find in literature rather than the truth that some priest class tells us to find. You know? And the reasons why I've always been more interested in polytheisms than monotheisms is because they're so much more novelistic. You know, the, the monotheisms don't have nearly such good stories, you know? And also, they're tediously moralizing. <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, the, the, great, the great thing about these, these ancient pantheons is that the gods are not moral. You know, and, and the, the gods don't say, do as we do, because they behave really badly all the time, you know? <laughs> the gods are lustful and greedy and vengeful and petty and, and, and you know, spiteful and malicious and capricious and stupid. And they are, in other words, just like us, you know, only much, much bigger, and therefore they can be just like us on a much bigger scale. And so it seems to me what interests me about them is, if you like, their human characteristics. You know, they're, they're not, not as some kind of repository of spirituality, but as a repository of human nature, you know? Um, and they show us ourselves magnified and, and projected onto a giant screen. And I like the idea of, of gods that don't behave well, you know? Um, it's so much more enjoyable than preachy gods, you know, who I just, for some mysterious reason, don't care for at all. Um, <laughs> so that's, I mean, I come at it from, from that direction. And, and then I just asked myself this, I hope, comically poignant question. How sad it must be to be a god that is discarded. You know, to be one minute omnipotent and the next minute unemployed. <laughs> um, and that there's obviously now an enormous number of such deities, the human race having gone on for the thousands of years that it has. And where do they all go and what do they do, these discarded gods? You know? So this is a kind of gods, a sort of unemployed gods graveyard that, that, that Luca stumbles into at one point in this book. And there they all are, trying to pretend they're still divine but actually being useless, you know? Uh, but, I mean, that's just my comic inversion, you know? But the, my real interest is, is this idea that, that, that these grand storehouses of narrative um, become available to us in a more interesting way once they stop being um, living religions. So they become more interesting, to me anyway, so. Thank you. And Joseph Campbell may or may not agree with that, but, yeah. <laughs> My question, in, in a way, is a continuation of the last woman's question, and maybe you have a little further elaboration. Uh, in your novel, um, we have the ancient gods lined up trying to prevent Luca from saving his father's life. I'm wondering if in some way his father is also God the Father, and the imagination and playfulness and devoted companionship that Luca brings to his quest to his father, to save his father, in a way, is a quest to save our own concept of the father God. God, that's almost a shocking question. In a novel by me? <laughs> that's, You're also the father. You know, I mean, it just shows that people will find stuff in books. <laughs> <laughs> but, but, you know, for all I know, maybe there, but I'm not going to admit it. <laughs> uh, no, I think that what, I was, what Luca is trying to say to these disused deities is that having lost their power, their only chance of survival is through the agency of storytelling. The, the only chance they have of being known or remembered or even thought about is if somebody like Luca's dad, Rashid, tells their story. And so the death of the storyteller is also their death. You know, and, and so, so what he's saying is, you know, you better help because if he dies, so do you. you know? um, and it's, it works. 
it works, it persuades them, because they're vain, of course. Um, and the great thing about, about, the, about formerly super powerful entities is that an appeal to their vanity is, is probably successful. <laughs> um, but I think it's about that. It's, I, would say, I would say it's about that. But, you know, uh, it sounds like a doctoral thesis to me. <laughs> Salman Rushdie's religious novel. Wow. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Rushdie. Yeah. Um, my question is about something that Juno Diaz recently published in The Brief Wondrous Life of Oscar Wow. He says that Rushdie claims that tyrants and scribblers are natural antagonists. Um, that who and scribblers? Tyrants. Tyrants scribblers. and scribblers. Yes. Are natural antagonists. Yes. Um, Diaz says that that's too simple. He says it lights, lets writers off too easily. Dictators, in his opinion, just no competition when they see it. Same with writers. Uh, do you have a response to that? <laughs> well, well I, you know, I admire Junot Diaz very much, and I completely agree with him. <laughs> um, uh, no, what, I, what I was trying to say, which is, of course, like any aphorism, it's only true up to a point. Um, the, 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 the point I was trying to make is that writers and tyrants, but in a way, any, uh, any politician, uh, the reason that they're natural antagonists is that they're trying to do the same thing. They're trying to offer, or they're all trying to offer a vision of the world and impose it on the world as it exists. You know, they're, try, they're trying to say, here's how I think it is or should be, and uh, the difference is that writers put this between the covers of a book which they call fiction. Um, politicians pretend it's the truth. Uh, and that creates an adversarial relationship. But I do think that it's one of the reasons why, I mean, it seems very mysterious that in this day and age that, that authoritarian regimes, tyrants, should be so interested in locking up writers. You know, I mean, writers have no armies. You know, they, have, they, they, have very, they have very easily silenced voices in many ways. And yet, it becomes almost first business you know, for, for any tyrannical regime to, to move against the writers. You know? and, and I think it's because they recognize that, that there's a quarrel going on about how you describe the world. You know? and, and, and that by describing the world, you also change the possibilities of the world. And, and, and writers and politicians are therefore at war. I don't, think that, I don't mean always, you know, or, but I just mean that there's a, they have the same project in a way, you know, but they come at it from different directions and for different purposes. And so they often argue. That's what I meant. Juno meant something else, but that's fine too. Thank you. <laughs> Mr. Rishti, this is indeed a pleasure. Uh, of all the many cities in your writing and in your life, Bombay, of course, has been very early and very central. Uh, my, I was just curious about what your present thoughts on or relationship with that city is. With Bombay? With Bombay, specifically, uh, you know, in light of the recent uh, Rohinton mystery affair. Oh, well, certainly about Rohinton, I mean, it's. Uh, I don't know, are people here aware of what happened to Rowenton Mysteries' book in Bombay? No. Well, Rowenton Mysteries, now, I think, what is it, 20-year-old novel, such a long journey. Um, very fine novel. It's been freely available in India ever since it was published and, and was on the syllabus of Bombay University in the English, English department. Unfortunately, Bombay University has recently acquired um, a chancellor who is... Uh, let's say, sympathetic to the interests of uh, a very bigoted political movement, the Shiv Sena, which is both Hindu nationalist and, and narrowly Marathi language nationalist and crypto-fascist and a few other things, um, and headed by a former cartoonist um, uh, called Bal Thakre and his family. So what happens is that the, one of the youngest of the Thakarais, the grandson, in a bid for political glory, discovers that such a long journey has passages which are disrespectful of the Shiv Sena and, and the, and the Thakarais. 
And so he calls the head of the university and says, you've got to take it off the syllabus. And without any discussion, this is done. Um, so a work of literature that is freely available in the country has always been, has been taught with great respect in, on a university syllabus, is banned just because one little kid who's hardly out of the egg and, and probably has not even read a newspaper in his life, let alone a novel, um, says so. And it's been shocking. I mean, it's shocking. And I'm, there's, obviously, it's, it's good that there has been a very large uh, and a uh, powerful response to that. Uh, but the trouble is that, you know, the ruling dynasty of India, the, you know, Sonia Gandhi and, and, and gang, are very unlikely to help Rowington out here because the book is actually ruder about them <laughs> than it is about the Shiv Sena. You know, so, um, so there we are. It's now considered to be acceptable to ban a book because it criticizes a political party. You know, and, and I do think that what's happening in India, I was in India not so long ago and, and spoke about this at a, at a, at a uh, large gathering in Delhi, um, organized by the India Today magazine. Um, I said, you know, oddly, as India, on the one hand, seems to be moving forward in the world, you know, economically and so on, there's another sense in which it is sliding violently backwards and, and its relationship to the arts is, at the, is, the, is the center of that problem. You can now attack a painter and, de and destroy his paintings because you disapprove of their content. You can you know, ban a book because somebody is displeased by its political point of view, for goodness sake. You know, um, one of the most shocking occasions, events re in recent years was after this American historian James Lane wrote uh, a, a biography of Shivaji, who is the kind of patron warrior king of the Shiv Sena, they decided that they disliked his book, and so they went and attacked and destroyed volumes in the library he had used to research the book. So these ancient Indian documents were destroyed, this act of hooliganism, because the Shiv Sena disliked what he had written as a result of reading those documents. So, Film sets are attacked by, by hooligan gangs and, and, and the possibility of films being made which are critical of the government or critical of the status quo in India are, are harder to, it's, it's harder to do that now. So, you know, on the one hand, of course, India is a wonderful place and so on, and it's, it's, it's a great thing that this huge and complicated and poor country has continued to, very, in a very determined way, wish to be a democracy. But this is, this is a terrible wound to that democracy, you know, and, and uh, all we can do is make a noise, you know, um, but I don't see it changing because the ruling authorities in India don't seem to understand that this kind of attack on intellectual freedom is a bad thing. Very often when any religious group or interest group or pressure group complains about a work of art, the authorities blame the artist for stirring up public sentiment, you know, and, and uh, this reversal of, what, of where the blame should be is it's a very worrying thing. Thank you. Yes. No question. I just wanted to say thank you very, very much. Oh. <laughs> Keep going. <laughs> oh, thanks. Hello. I also thank you. It's a great honor. Uh, I had the opportunity to ask you a question during the, uh, the Ground Beneath uh, Her Feet tour. Oh, yeah. Uh, about uh, shift gears a little bit and talk about your craft, the writing process. And I had mentioned that the, the lyrical quality of your prose seems as if it just streams out, stream of consciousness. Oh, sure. And you, <laughs> no, you said no. You said it is all revision. So I, mm. I'm here to follow up uh, many years later. Do you do a full draft? Do you write a paragraph, rework it? Is it a different kind of thing? Anything else you can say about your writing process, where you like to write best, the whole? Yeah, no, actually, I lied last time. It just comes out. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, you know, the truth is it's, it's a little bit changed the way what's happened in my writing is that when I was younger, I. I would write more in a day than I do now. I would write maybe twice as much in a day as, as I do now. But it would be much more imperfect. You know, it would need much more work. Um, now what tends to happen is I, I don't write that much in a day. You know, if I, if I get 500 words done, it feels like a lot. 
Um, whereas previously I would write over a thousand words a day, every day, always, sometimes 1,500, etc. And now I can only dream about that. But what seems to happen is that the stuff, are, by the time I've finished work on my few hundred words a day, it's, they seem to be much closer to a finished product um, and, and seem to require less revision. So I think what you lose in youthful energy, you hopefully gain a little bit in control. You know, and that's my theory anyway. Do you, do you, do you, <laughs> you know, when you're young, you have to fake wisdom, and when you're old, you have to fake energy. <laughs> I like that. I like that. Um, you do, it well. do you finish the whole story and go go back and revise, or is it a? No. I mean, I, well, yes, I do. But these days, most of the work is done step by step. Okay. I mean, I, there's the, the weirdest revision technique I know of a writer I probably shouldn't say, um, who writes in pencil, in longhand, in in notebooks. <laughs> And when he rereads a chapter and comes across stuff that he doesn't like, he rubs it out with an eraser. And then his fetish is to replace what he's erased with, by something which fits in the same space. <laughs> and, and, um, yeah, so, you know, there are many ways of doing this. <laughs> All right. All right. Thank you. Thank you. So we just have a, pardon my interruption, we only have a, a few minutes left here, so if uh, we can fit in these last three questions, yeah. if we uh, make them brief. Thank you. <clears throat> Question for both of you. Uh, it may touch on the Grimm brothers and as well as other things. There was a psychologist at Harvard, um, uh, McClelland, who wrote a book called The Achieving Society. And he wondered how come some societies are able to achieve more than others? And the answer that he gave was the stories that the children are told. And he thought some cultures <clears throat> have stories that are conducive to hard work. They believe in if you work hard, you'll be rewarded and things like that. Others are uh, sort of fatalistic, etc. I wonder if each of you might comment on that. Um, <clears throat> one school of thought, for example, is that some of the German stories um, are conducive to brutality. Uh, a lot of the Russian stories in the 19th century um, are completely uh, magical and fatalistic. You go out and you work, and Father Frost comes along and zaps you for no good reason. So, Mr. Rushdie, I wonder whether, whether you think your work may <laughs> have something to do with the upbringing uh, of children, but both of you have read so, so widely. Uh, I wonder if you could comment on this McClellan theory. Uh, you go, you go theory. first. Oh, I, well, I'm always reluctant to make these nationalistic, uh, draw these nationalistic differences, because when I started studying the Grimm's, yes, there was violence, bloodshed, cruelty, incest, murder, uh, decapitation, all of these horrors. And then I started reading stories from other cultures and finding that Same it thing. was often worse. The Grimm's had edited, we don't know how much they edited, but it was not reassuring to find uh, what was in other cultures. I think, though, what, and if I can connect here with, with this book, uh, this idea that, which we find in so many folkloric traditions, that somehow uh, transgressive energy oh. is something that the child needs. Uh, you know, the ability to sort of, uh, to have courage as, you know, you show in that passage that you read, but also to use your wits to outsmart mm. uh, the forces of evil, to conquer those monsters that are out there. Yeah, yeah I mean, I, you see, I, what I think is that if you, if you look at this, this storehouse of world narrative, you, you can find very similar stories. I, for instance, yes, you're right that the Grimm's have lots of brutality, but then if you have, a, you know, take a story like The Fisherman and His Wife, it's, it's about indolence, it's about laziness. You know, and if you come in the Indian tradition, you'll find very similar stories about laziness, but you also find stories of intense brutality. You know? So this may just be that this is the kind of creature we are, this is human nature, you know, and we, wherever we are, we tell each other stories of all these kinds. Um, the question of transgression, I think, is it's very important because I think in many ways, again, a globally available story, the story of the trickster, 
you know, whether it's, uh, uh, whether it's you know, Anansi Spider, the Caribbean, or wherever you may look, you have these stories of a, trick of a trickster Hiyobi character, Hiyobi, yeah. you know? And, and the point about the trickster is that he breaks the rules. He, he doesn't play the game according to the rules. <coughs> and, and there's something about that, which is that's how you solve the problem. You solve the problem by not playing according to the rules. And I've always remembered this as a brief story about an Andy Warhol. There's an Andy Warhol work that I saw a long time ago in a big pop art retrospective in, in London. And it was, you remember those dance patterns, Arthur Murray dance patterns, left foot, right foot, one, two, three, four. It was a, it was a dance pattern. Mm -hmm. And it was on a glass, under glass, on a raised in a raised box about six inches off the ground. And we were all encouraged to get in line and do the dance pattern. And, and as I was waiting in line, I noticed that everybody who got on got to a certain point and got stuck <laughs> and would then shake their heads and get off. And when I got closer, there was, there was somebody said, but you can't do it because your weight's on the wrong leg. And it was true that the way the pattern had been drawn, there was a point where all your weight was on your left leg and then you had to move your left leg. And so it was an impossible yeah. dance pattern. Anyway, so in front of me, there's this eight-year-old girl, nine-year-old girl or something, and she gets on to do it. And she comes to this impossible point and she says, oh, I see, you've got to step off the pattern. Uh, <laughs> right, yeah. <laughs> and she just stepped off the pattern, changed her weight, uh. completed it. And so I thought, you know, that's it, break the frame. You know, and Warhol is a smart enough artist to know what he was doing. He was saying, you know, the way you solve the problem is to break the frame. Um, and, and I think there's, that's at the heart of a lot of this kind of, I mean, that's what Luca's doing. You know, he's having, he's, to, uh, he's having to, in a way, you answer a riddle with another riddle. You know, you're, you're given a riddle, but in order to solve the riddle, you have to create a riddle of your own. And it's that, that trickster spirit. I don't know whether this is world culture. I can't tell you whether, you know, Germans are brutal and Indians are mystical. Um, but actually, the Indian tradition is as savage as you could wish for. <laughs> it's, it's just wonderfully violent. I recommend it highly. <laughs> Hi. Um, I had a question about a character whose name I'm probably going to say it wrong. Ratchet? Ratchet? Ratchet. Ratchet, okay. It's a kid called Ratchet in this book. All right, I thought that was probably what it was. Well, it sounds just like Rashid. Yes, but it's actually Ratchet. <laughs> Ratchet. Okay, so my question about him. <laughs> my question about him, I noticed that in the Respector Rat, yes. he is the... The Overrat. The Overrat, thank you. And I was wondering if you could expand upon this because this is supposed... Originally it was supposed to be his father's world and I was wondering why his son's childhood nemesis mm. played such a role in it. Because his father doesn't like him either. <laughs> um, I mean, you know, like any parent, I have seen boys at school who are, you know, the same age as my children, who are little assholes. <laughs> <laughs> and I don't like them either. <laughs> so, so I'm just getting some revenge. <laughs> I mean, what's the point of being a writer if you can't get even? <laughs> um, no, it's just, a, you're, it's a very good question, but it's, it's for that reason. It's that fathers, it's that parents look at children too. <laughs> and some of them they like, some of them not so much. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks. One last. Hi, um, you mentioned The Wizard of Oz being very influential to you, yeah. and could you name some other books and movies that you found particularly influential? Oh, all right, yeah, well this is where we can get to talk about Lewis Carroll. Um, I mean, I went to rugby school in England, a pretty unpleasant boys boarding school. I mean, now it's less unpleasant because now they have girls. Um, <laughs> but in those days, it was 900 boys locked up together. You can only imagine what hell that was. Um, but the thing that I was most proud of was that Lewis Carroll went to rugby school. I mean, other great writers, you know, Matthew Arnold, Rupert Brooke went, went there. But, but for me, I thought, it'll do. The author of Alice in Wonderland, that'll be fine. And I've always just adored those books. And one of the greatest things I ever saw was in the British Library in London, they actually have uh, 
the, the notebook in which, in fair copy handwriting, he wrote out the entire text of what was then called Alice's Adventures Underground um, and gave it as a gift to Alice Pleasance Little. Um, with drawings in the margins, and actually the drawings are pretty damn good. Right. And you can see that John Tenniel, when he was doing the illustrations, must have looked at Lewis Carroll's drawings and used them as, as the basis for his own more elaborate drawings. Um, I thought a lot about, when I was writing Luca and the Fire of Life, I thought a lot about what it must have been like for Lewis Carroll to write Through the Looking Glass. You know, this is what, seven years after Alice's Adventures in Wonderland. And in that period, that book has already become a very beloved book. You know, it's, it's, it's become, I mean, more or less an instant classic. Um, and so he's got the follow that problem. You know, wouldn't it be awful to write a follow-up to Alice in Wonderland and everybody say, well, the first one was good, but this one, eh. <laughs> you know? so, so there's that, which must have been in his mind. The other thing that made it very difficult to write that book was that Alice was no longer a child. That, you know, the Alice that he wrote for uh, in, in, in the first book had grown up in seven years. She was now a young woman. And also he'd become estranged from the family, and so he, he didn't see her anymore. And actually, while we're here, we may as well exonerate him from the charge of pedophilia, because there's always been this, this idea that, that the reason that, that Alice's family broke away or broke off relations with Lewis Carroll was because they thought it was something a bit weird about his feelings towards this young girl. But it now seems that the latest thing I read is that it seems it might have been more because he had an affair with the nanny. <laughs> <laughs> which offends the class system, you see. So, uh, so you, of course, have to get rid of him because he's sleeping with the servants. Um, anyway, I think that's a better explanation than him having weird, re weird feelings about Alice because Alice herself, all her life, defended him, spoke very highly of him, n said that he had never in any way been anything but gentlemanly and appropriate and so on and so on. Anyway, it struck me how hard it must have been for him to write that second book. You know, everybody talks about Alice's Adventures in Wonderland, but actually, Through the Looking Glass is a very, very considerable book, and, and much harder to write than the first one. In it, there's a beautiful, he begins it with this acrostic poem, which has the whole of Alice's name, Alice Pleasance Little, with a line of verse for each letter of, of the name, and uh, divided into three line verses. And I've always thought the key is that there's a, in the middle, there's a, a, a verse which is as with the, the letters S-A-N from her middle name, Pleasance. It's, that, it's those three, and, it's, it, and he says, he says, still she haunts me phantom-wise, Alice moving under skies never seen by waking eyes. And I just thought this is what he's doing. He's haunted by her. You know, he's writing out of a figure that he can't get out of his head. And which is kind of beautiful and sad and so on and, and creates the beauty of that book. So I thought, you know, if you can do one-tenth as well as that, that'll be fine. I, I, I tell you, I, I'm so obsessed with this stuff that I can recite the whole of Jabberwocky, if you want. I can recite the whole of The Walrus oh, and the Carpenter, <laughs> if you like, and sometimes even if you don't like. <laughs> um, so, yeah, I mean, I, you know, if you've got the time, I've got the, you know, I've got the inclination. Are you game? <laughs> um, <laughs> um, you Would you do it? No, no, please. Which and one? then you can read, uh, oh, how about Jabberwocky? Oh, it was brillig in the slithy <laughs> toves. Did gyre and gimble in the wave, all mimsy with the borogoves and the mome wraths outgrave. Beware the Jabberwock, my son, the eyes that flash, the claws that catch. Beware the Jubjub bird and shun the frumious bandersnatch. He girdled on his vorpal sword, long time the manxome foe he sought. So rested he by the tum-tum tree, and stood a while in thought. And as in uffish thought he stood, the jabberwock with eyes of flame came whiffling through the tulgy wood, and burbled as it came. As it came. One, two, one, two, and through and through the vorpal sword went snicker-snack. He left it dead, and with its head he went galumphing back. And hast thou slain the Jabberwock? Come to my arms, my beamish boy. O frabjous day, kaloo kalay. He chortled in his joy. Twas brillig, 
and the slithy toves did gyre and gimble in the wave, all mimsy with the borogoves and the mome wraths outgrave. I cannot think of a better way to end the evening. And let me thank you for thank you. By invoking Angela Carter, the, who I know was a friend of yes, yours. Uh, you. She told us about the cauldron of story and how we keep adding ingredients to it. And I think we all want to thank you for keeping that pot stirring. Thank you. Thank you, thank sir. You. Thank you.